Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, an event at the Fletcher School, uh, what promises to be a fascinating discussion on uh, the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan and the security implications for China, Russia, and Central Asia. Uh, I uh, am Arik Burakovsky. I manage the Russia and Eurasia program at Fletcher, and we are pleased today to be collaborating with the Religion, Law, and Diplomacy Initiative at Fletcher. Um, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Elizabeth Prodromu. She is a visiting associate professor of uh, conflict resolution at Fletcher, uh, and she will be moderating the discussion today. Uh, so Elizabeth, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Arik, um, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone, depending where you are on the planet. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be co-hosting uh, this event uh, with uh, the program on Russia and Eurasia at the Fletcher School. Uh, the Initiative on Religion, Law and Diplomacy is really excited to uh, be part of this event today and to welcome today's distinguished panelists. Um, a, a lot has been said about the crisis in Afghanistan. Um, I hope our, our speakers today will say a little bit about um, how we define crisis, when it actually began, and um, if we continue to see what's happening as crisis. Um, but as we all know, the proximate cause of um, the, what we're calling the crisis was the U.S. withdrawal of forces from the country and the Taliban's very speedy consolidation of control over the country, um, including a dec the declaration of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, uh, the announcement of a new government, which much to the grave concern, certainly of Afghan citizens and the international community as well, excluded women and other social and political representation that would signal a meaningful intentional shift towards uh, political pluralism in Afghanistan. Now, a lot has already been said about the crisis, um, but what I think is really exciting about today's uh, panel of experts is that they're going to help us train the lens on Afghanistan within the broader geospace of Eurasia. And to think about Afghanistan as part of this broad uh, geographical space um, that stretches from Russia and China uh, through Central Asia, from the Caspian Sea uh, to the Indian Ocean. Um, and certainly that includes the former Soviet republics of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan. So we have three brilliant speakers who will explore the prompt questions that we shared in advance of today's panel. Let me introduce you. Their bios were circulated. I urge you to do a deeper dive into their, um, their rich research, body of research. Um, I'm gonna just give you a brief um, introduction so that we have plenty of time to hear from them and then for discussion. Our first speaker today is uh, Neva Yao, who's a researcher at the OSCE Academy in Bishkek. And she's also a fellow at the Eurasia program of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, FPRI, in Philadelphia. And her work focuses in particular on China's foreign policy, trade, and security. Um, our second speaker is uh, Dr. Nargis Kasanova, who's a senior fellow and director of the program on Central Asia. Uh, in Cambridge at the Davis Center for Russia, Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard. Um, and her work uh, focuses uh, heavily on Central Asian Studies in China and Central Asia. And then finally, we have Dr. Maxim Max Suchkov, who's a senior fellow at the Laboratory for International Trends Analysis. And he's an associate professor at the Department of Applied International Analysis at NGIMO, the Moscow State Institute of International Relations. Um, which belongs to the Russian Federation, its Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I've not done justice to the richness of their bios, but I urge you to uh, look online and I welcome them all today. And we will begin um, with um, the first presentation by uh, Niva Yao. Niva, it's a pleasure to welcome you here. Thank you, Professor, and thank you um, all of the Fletcher members today and audience for joining in. Um, it's great to join this panel with two other very excellent experts on this topic. Um, so since we have a very short opening speech of seven minutes, I'm going to briefly talk about how has China responded to the Afghanistan situation since 15th of August, the fall of Kabul. 
Um, there has been a lot of things that's quite consistent that's coming out of the official um, Chinese speech about the Afghanistan situation. So first and foremost is that China is looking for an inclusive government. It is not looking for a Pashtun-led government. It is looking for an inclusive government across all ethnic groups and across all um, religious groups as well in Afghanistan. Um, second thing is China's clearly asked uh, the Taliban to cut ties with all international terrorist groups. And of course, uh, what China is really um, trying to say here is that the Taliban needs to cut ties with um, the East Turkestan movement, which is um, a movement that uh, works to um, make the Xinjiang region uh, an independence, uh, independent country. By the way, I'm, for, I'm very sorry, everyone, because I'm based in Bishkek, it's 10 p.m. my time, so if I'm a bit you know, low energy, this is why. <laughs> Um, so we have, you know, China saying that, you know, they want uh, inclusive government in Afghanistan, they want the Taliban to cut ties with international terrorist groups. And, uh, and then a very big part of this story of how uh, these things actually wants to get pushed by China is that, you know, China's push, pushing for a regional effort um, for regional governments or working with regional governments and regional players uh, to actually push for the th these things and communicate these things to the Taliban. Um, and one more request that is, you know, in this uh, dynamic is that um, China has been asking Taliban to actually establish good relations with neighboring countries. So, of course, that in mind is the Tajikistan, because Tajikistan has not had, you know, a good relation with Taliban. And in certain speeches as well, China has welcomed countries like Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan for, you know, actually having a dialogue with the Taliban. So this has been consistent. Um, and that's, you know, across, uh, uh, you know, this, this entire year and, of course, emphasized ever since like 15th of August. But then there are also three very interesting observations in the past month as things uh, developed with, um, you know, Taliban's leadership in, in Kabul. First is that um, before 15th of August, China actually called for a, a stable and productive Islamic policy in Afghanistan. Um, and but this speech is now absolutely absent from the Chinese official statements. The last time that the Chinese Communist Party actually mentioned uh, uh, calling Taliban to have a good Islamic policy was this. I think we have a freeze. because you know, China is now having to work with you know countries like Qatar, countries like Egypt and Turkey to manage the relations with Taliban and manage all the other international terrorist groups. And in doing so, it cannot touch things like religion. Um, so this is a very interesting, this is completely vanished. Second thing is, you know, China has been managing this Afghanistan situation both domestically and internationally. Um, the Chinese public, as much as we want to think that, you know, the Chinese Communist Party is very, you know, dictatorship-like, and it is, but the Chinese public still has, you know, some say in some international affairs once it has gained huge interest in the Chinese public. And some statements in China are actually very conflicted when it comes to the Afghanistan situation. So on one hand, the Chinese officials wanted to present, uh, uh, you know, uh, this dynamic that Taliban defeated the U.S., and that US is some sort of loser, um, something like that. But then on the other hand, in the public, uh, in the public eye, you know, this was not okay for Chinese officials to be saying all these nice things about Taliban because you know, the, the word Taliban and the group Taliban has a very strong image in the average Chinese person. So, and this was actually um, trending on Chinese uh, social media, people asking who is this group Taliban? You know, what, do they, what do they do in Afghanistan? Um, and all of these content were, were getting a lot of likes and shares and a lot of discussions. And once that took place, it was completely shut down because you know, the, the Chinese officials were not okay with the public actually engaging into this topic of what should China do when it comes to Afghanistan. And the officials actually changed their tone of voice. Um, in the past one week and a half, <clears throat> there's been a very clear shift in the Chinese public speeches, the official speeches, to actually not mention the word Taliban at all. So now they have replaced the word Taliban with the new government in Afghanistan or just Afghanistan in general. And this is a, a very important dynamic that I think a lot of scholars work on China. They, it's really important to, to, to know that a lot of what the Chinese officials say, a lot of the times is the audience is the Chinese public. 
So the interest of the Chinese public and what the Chinese public is really thinking is also very important um, in, in understanding, you know, how does, you know, the Chinese officials really think about, you know, the situation. And then the third um, interesting observation in just the past month is that initially China had this emphasis to actually emphasize on um, wanting the US and allies countries to deal with Afghanistan in terms of refugees. And there were a lot of initial um, emphasis and initial kind of push to keep saying that, um, you know, we need to investigate the international community need to investigate the war crimes committed by US and allies in Afghanistan. But then again, in the past two weeks, this tone has absolutely shifted again. It's, this, is, this is not even being mentioned anymore. It is all about, now it's all about pushing a regional effort um, in across, across different areas like humanitarian aid, pandemic, borders, anti-terrorism. It's, it's been all about you know, how to find a regional consensus where, where, where in, the, in the framework of regionalism in this region, um, things can actually be done because China has given up basically on asking you know, countries in the EU, countries you know, like US to actually deal with refugees and manage all these other issues. Um, but the, on the only thing that has you know, kept US in the speech of you know, uh, Afghanistan issue in, in the China space is that um, the economic sanctions. So the only thing left that China is blaming the US for now is that US is blocking this uh, economic sanction on Afghanistan and on the members of Taliban and that you know, this, is, this is not going to work with you know, all this humanitarian aid that China wants the international community to push forward and everything. Um, so this has been the development in the past month and a lot of things is actually still happening and they're changing really fast, particularly with the um, recent SEO summit that just closed last week. A lot of things are getting 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 into um, negotiation stages now after um, all of the security agreements that were signed during the summit. So it is still to be seen whether or not, for example, last week um, when Iran officially officially joined signed to join the SCO, which would take a year, but it depend it, it now waiting to be seen whether or not you know this uh, Iranian inclusion into the regional organization would actually you know have a, have an effect. Um, so I saw the one minute mark um, that was um, just now on Eric. So I'll, I'll stop here because um, you know this has really been the background. I'm sure everyone's following what's happening. So I think we would just um, wait to the Q&A section to see if there's other additional things to be discussed. Thank you. Thank you so much for a fantastic introduction, Eva, and in particular calling our attention to the importance of discourse analysis and how we think about what's happening in the, in the region when it comes to Afghanistan. Now we will turn to um, to Nargis for the second presentation. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it is it is an honor and pleasure to be uh, to be on this panel. Um, I'll make some general sort of observations on this on the situation, and then maybe we can um, kind of dis discuss details in the in the Q and A. Uh, so the situation is uh, both new and not so new because um, because Taliban have been around for decades and uh, the you know they appeared in the early 90s when when it happened it was not uh, not cl clear who are these people now uh, Central Asian public is sort of is I think would be probably more familiar than the Chinese one what Niva said that okay. Uh, they don't know who they are, uh, they're discovering them. There is more kind of more familiarity uh, in, in the region. And there have been years and years of discussions of uh, uh, spillovers of instability, uh, drug trafficking, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, in, in this sense, it's not that uh, it's, you know, kind of we had no crisis before and there is a crisis. Now we've had crisis for, for years and years. Yeah. So, uh, and for years and years, the, the, there was fighting in in Afghanistan, and uh, the uh, uh, the problem of the drug trafficking was, you know, getting bigger and bigger. Um, but the at the, but at the same time, yes, it is a new situation, uh, and uh, well, new in the sense that the uh, the the Afghan state collapsed. Uh, so fast in a blink of an eye and many people were shocked. I, I was shocked, although after reading the Afghanistan papers, I understand that we shouldn't have been um, that surprised. Um, uh, 
well, also unlike in the 1990s and the first decade of the uh, 2000s, there is no strong opposing force to the to the Taliban. Uh, before we had, well, we had there was the Northern Alliance, and the Northern Alliance was sort of uh, uh, providing this buffer zone between uh, between the, the Taliban and uh, uh, the region. Um, so what we have today, the National Resistance Front, it's not up to the it's not up to the level. Um, there is now there is no well there is the U.S. withdrawal for real. Um, I remember discussions prior to the 2014 uh, withdrawal, and many experts in the region were skeptical that there would be full uh, full U.S. withdrawal. Uh, and and at the time they turned out to be uh, turned out to be right. Now it actually happened. Uh, and what are the implications of uh, the U.S. withdrawal uh, for uh, for the region? Um, Afghanistan was not the only factor that made Central Asia of interest to the U.S., but uh, but it has been an important factor. So let's see how this will uh, this will play out. Um, uh, well. Uh, Linked to that, the region is sort of left to its uh, devices, and uh, well, regional powers welcome that. Um, they are sort of generally happy to see the U.S. Uh, go, uh, but let's see how effective regional regional powers will be in sorting out this uh, pretty desperate uh, desperate situation. Uh, also. Um, What's new is the broader diversity of the approaches um, of, uh, uh, of Central Asian states to the situation in, in Afghanistan, to Taliban. Um, Turkmenistan sort of has been the most consistent. Uh, it was on talking terms with the Taliban you know, starting from the 90s. Um, but the others were much more concerned and uh, and 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 opposed. Now we uh, now we see Uzbekistan um, welcoming the creation of the interim Taliban government, uh, having talks with the Taliban, waiting for the situation to come down to stabilize, uh, in order to have trade, in order to uh, to build transit corridors via the Afghanistan to uh, to South Asia. So that that's uh, that's different. Uh, Tajikistan is surprisingly proactive. Um, it's, we see Rahman making statements. Uh, we see the Tajik government calling on the international community to reprimand Taliban. Um, we see them morally supporting the uh, uh, the Panjshir resistance uh, and the latest offering to host Taliban uh, and uh, the opposition of the National Resistance Front um, talks in Dushanbe with the help of the, uh, with, the with the help of Pakistan. Um, as for Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, they, they sort of assume the wait and uh, wait and see position. Uh, so we see that the countries of the region they don't see eye to eye on the situation uh, um, situation with regard to Afghanistan. Um, well, Russian position is also quite complex, but we have uh, we have Professor Suchkov to, to talk about. Uh, so uh, all Central Asian states agree that it is a worrying situation. Uh, and uh, well, you can hear uh, talks about the danger, the threat of Islamic uh, uh, Islamic radicals across the border. Uh, it's not clear for it is not clear what's going to happen, um, whether the Taliban would be able to rein them in. Um, the, there are discussions of the ideological influence, um, but it seems to me it's not a, uh, it's not a great threat um, because, well, Taliban, they are too archaic for, uh, for Central Asians. I don't think that the kind of um, they will have much soft power in the region, uh, but there is a present and clear danger, and that's uh, a series of uh, humanitarian crises that uh, are already taking place uh, in uh, in Afghanistan. And um, Central Asian states can play a, a constructive role uh, in uh, tackling uh, tackling these challenges. Um, 
we know that they are not particularly willing to uh, to accept refugees, uh, with the exception of Tajikistan. Uh, we know that that Tajikistan is uh, preparing um, refugee camps uh, on the border um, with the help of the uh, European Union. Um, we, I haven't seen the numbers. Maybe somebody in the audience knows the numbers. Initially, uh, the Tajik authorities uh, gave uh, the, the number of hundred thousand uh, refugees that they are ready to, uh, they would be ready to accept. But, but it's, it's to me, it's not clear. Um, I, I don't think it will be massive. Uh, the well, I think Central Asian states can play. Uh, a more constructive role with uh, bringing humanitarian aid to uh, to Afghanistan. Um, the uh, there are no political costs there, um, so uh, here I would expect uh, I would expect more action on the Central Asian uh, Central Asian side. Um, so yes, I hope I haven't exceeded my time. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Okay, that's a great segue from human security issues in Central Asia to our final panelist and presenter. Uh, Maxime, we'll let you have the floor for the, the last part of the conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to be with the Fletcher School. Uh, so there, I'll, I'll talk, briefly mention the three uh, themes of the Russian discourse on the situation in Afghanistan and the four issues that Moscow seems to be concerned with, uh, given uh, that the Taliban now control uh, the country. So the, uh, I would say that the Russian political discourse, especially, and especially the public one, has evolved around three major themes as far as Afghanistan is concerned. One, uh, what uh, Moscow saw is the ultimate American failure at a nation uh, building in Afghanistan. Two, uh, this, the criticism of the Afghan government and three, uh, the very security situation in, in Afghanistan uh, now with the Taliban in power and the, the risks that it may pose for uh, the Russia's uh, southern flank, uh, in, including uh, Central Asia. Uh, the first discourse uh, actually, like I said, it, it's, it's kind of more, it, it's more, uh, it has to do more with the gloating uh, over the American failure but not just the mere gloating and criticism of, oh, look, you know, the U.S. have failed. It, it is packaged in, in a way uh, together with the second theme of the criticism of the Afghan government that, that fled uh, the, the country, the president uh, of Afghanistan, Ashraf Ghani, uh, but it's kind of packaged for countries across, uh, well, not just in the post-Soviet space, Ukraine, Georgia in particular, but also countries in the Middle East, uh, both the governments and opposition groups uh, that may be relying on the United States or cooperation with the United States at, at different levels. Uh, the message that Moscow is trying to, to uh, convey is, you know, the Americans are unlikely to help you, they're, they're more likely to make things worse. So this is kind of, the, these very two uh, themes of the discourse have little to do with Afghanistan per se, and more uh, with kind of uh, Russia's own uh, spat with the United States, right, or Russia's effort to undermine U.S. influence across uh, across the world. Uh, that's that's one uh, aspect of it. Uh, it also, I think, uh, has to do with this idea that you know that the, the the American decision to draw down forces from Afghanistan marks the era marks the end of the era that began after 9-11 uh, terrorist atrocities uh, with this kind of uh, counterterrorism being the, the, the major paradigm of American uh, for, foreign and defense and security policy and begins the era of the kind of great power rivalry. You know, the idea is the United States are now willing to free resources to, to, to tackle China and, and part Russia more than the, the terrorist and it's kind of, this is what the American uh, government and, and the United States is more interested in. So for Russia, it actually opens a, a new page, uh, potentially, again, uh, with, with the fight, uh, or, 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 or the page on the fight with terrorism. And there are many security experts here who warn that 
you know, uh, for, for it's just for the people in academia and, and professionals who know the differences between, you know, the Taliban and ISIS and, and other groups. For the people who may be fueled by these extremist ideologies, you know, the, the coming of Taliban to power is a success of some radical ideology. So whatever has not worked in Iraq and Syria now is in place in, in, in the Taliban. So it may potentially uh, trigger uh, some security concerns in Central Asia, but also in, in, in Russia, in the, in the Volga region or in the Caucasus. Which brings me to the third uh, discourse, uh, which is uh, Russia's own position on the Taliban. So the red lines uh, between Moscow and the Taliban, I would argue, have been drawn in July of this year when the, the, the high level Taliban delegation uh, was in Russia. And basically the conversation uh, there was that Moscow said its primary four issues that it is extremely concerned about is a uh, potential rise in uh, drug trafficking from uh, the Afghanistan to uh, Russia through Central Asia, b potential spillover of instability uh, from Afghanistan to Central Asia, uh, c uh, the security of uh, Russia's own uh, diplomatic compounds in Afghanistan. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, that the Taliban uh, do not host uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Taliban do not host the, any other extremist or terrorist organization. Uh, that is an interesting aspect and, and there is a lot of interesting conversation, also criticism uh, of Moscow, uh, like I think uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday, right? Uh, the Taliban hosted uh, senior officials uh, from Pakistan, China, and Russia. And uh, in the, in the uh, official statement that the foreign ministry rolled out, it said that uh, the, the special envoy expressed support uh, for, the, for, for, for the Taliban in their fight with ISIS, which is kind of interesting because the Taliban are also recognized as a terrorist organization in Russia as of early 2000s. Uh, but these four uh, kind of baskets or the, of issues or the four red lines that Russia has set for the Taliban are basically the contours of the uh, Russian policy toward the, this group uh, right now. I think uh, Moscow is still in the wait and see mode because we've seen officials uh, make, uh, stating that uh, Russia is not going to jump before everyone else in recognizing the Taliban as legitimate. Also, it keeps its uh, channels with the Taliban mostly through either the Russian embassy there or through the special envoy, uh, and is rather cautious about not uh, providing any more uh, kind of uh, high legitimacy to, to the group because it still needs to be uh, seen on, on whether the Taliban are able to deliver upon their commitments. So far, of the four things, that the Taliban quote-unquote promised to Moscow, uh, the only one has been uh, implemented, which is the security of the Russia's diplomatic compounds, and the Taliban are basically safeguarding uh, the, the Russian embassy in, in Kabul, and we need to see whether they, they still uh, deliver on the other three issues. I'll, I'll stop here. I'll be happy to uh, get in time to the Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you to all three of you for just really fantastic introductory interventions. There's a lot that's rich here to discuss. I'm going to use the prerogative uh, of the um, moderator chair and pitch a small question to each of you, after which we, you know, after you answer, then we will open up to general Q&A, okay? Um, I'll, I'll go in order, okay? Beginning, first of all, with Neva. I wonder, Neva, if um, you could say a little bit more about um, extra-regional or quasi-regional actors who are relevant for, um, for Central Asia, Russia, and China when it comes to Afghanistan. And that is, in particular, um, what seems to be this, you know, these two camps within the OIC. On the one hand, um, Turkey, Qatar, and Pakistan. And on the other hand, um, Iran, and maybe, you know, a third group even, the UAE and Saudi. How do those those sets of actors, and in particular um, Turkey, Qatar, and Pakistan, um, relate to to you know your assessment that you presented to us in the beginning? Um, then for Nargis, I wondered if you could amplify a little more on um, you know these points about 
intersectionality uh, with human security on the one hand and trade and economics on the other. And in particular, talk a little bit more about um, the emergence or the um, robustness of a narcotics-based economy that um, truly is regional and trans-regional um, and how the Taliban takeover may affect that. And then finally for Maxim, I wonder, you know, you closed by saying in the four um, kind of red line issues that Moscow laid out um, for the Taliban, it's only one of them, the security of Russia's diplomatic um, uh, compounds in Afghanistan that the Taliban thus far has delivered on. Um, my question to you is, okay, if they do not deliver on the others, and in particular, we begin to see real activity um, from a pretty diverse jihadist ecosystem already established in Afghanistan that affects Russia and Central Asia. What might Moscow do and with whom? Um, what Central Asian uh, partners with China or um, with partners perhaps outside of the region? It's the so what question. Okay, they, they aren't delivering, so what and with whom? So if I go first, yeah, with the order, I actually think this is a really interesting question because usually people, when they um, talk about Central Asia or when they talk about Central Asia and Afghanistan, um, it's mainly focused on China, Russia, US, maybe the EU, occasionally Turkey. Um, and then we kind of just forget that there are so many players here. There's South Korea, there's Iran, there's Qatar, there's Egypt, there's Saudi, and there's a lot of countries that are interested in this region. Um, and then again, also Southeast Asia uh, with Indonesia that's very interested in building relations with this region, Malaysia as well, Muslim majority, Southeast Asian nations. So there are a lot of interests um, from many different countries in this region. But if I focus on the ones that you mentioned, um, I, think, I think we have to look at this from a kind of an issue-based um, problem and then you know how these issues relate to the relations between Afghanistan and that said nation or that said group of nations um, and these two issues are really um, one is more immediate which is terrorism and then the second is more long term which is future connectivity of global trade um, and I know that you cast this question for Nagis, but really, I think, you know, this uh, turning point of, of Afghanistan is something that a lot of countries in this region have been waiting for, um, you know, this, you know, particularly with Uzbekistan and eyeing this connectivity to the, to the South Asia and, and access to the ocean and having this uh, completely different path than, you know, the development model in uh, Kazakhstan, which is more uh, dependent on China, more dependent on being that Eurasia, you know, key hub, you know, Uzbekistan is really wanting to be um, connected to Afghanistan. And, and that is reflected through, you know, its own kind of foreign policy choices as well and then turkey of course um you know has a has a you know has a much more has, has, a, has a much bigger ambition now you know with the turkish foreign policy kind of thinking um and of course it, it has you know been reflected as well not just in afghanistan but also in you know other regional conflicts um so i think terrorism is is um you know the the, the biggest issue that you know all of these countries that have their own interest in this region and have their own interest in afghanistan are, are thinking about because you know it, it is nervous you know to think that you know if taliban really is trying to professionalize as a political party which they are um you know and 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 all of these countries you know recognize that you know taliban is no longer you know, the, the, the group that we saw in the 90s, you know, the Taliban is really trying to have diplomacy and, and, and build a, a government and, and, and the Taliban really wants to be more connected to the world. And if that's the case, um, when it comes to, you know, having the Taliban to really address uh, ISIS and to really address the presence of other international terrorist groups in Afghanistan, then the question then becomes is where would they go? So many countries are working with the Taliban right now because simply they just need intelligence. They need to know where these terrorists are going and they need to be prepared and they, and they need to work with the Taliban because otherwise, you know, it, it, will, it will become a hub of, you know, many different uh, uh, other groups and, and it is not desirable for, you know, any of these countries that you mentioned in, 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 in your question. And I think, um, and I think, again, I want to bring the point back to regionalism because part of the reason why, you know, all, all of these um, kind of Arabic speaking countries that recently joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as observer states, you know, we're talking about Egypt, we're talking about Saudi Arabia, it's precisely this kind of outlook that, um, you know, there is going to be 
this change in the world of terrorism that you know it is going to be somewhere else and it is going to be you know manifested in a different way and um and so I so I will leave it at that. And then the future um, connectivity is is also um, you know I touched on a little bit on Uzbekistan, but then you know that also brings into um, you know the reason why these countries like Egypt and Qatar and Saudi Arabia are also you know in this kind of regionalism um, game now when it comes to Central Asia and Afghanistan because before there was absolutely just is it's just unfeasible for any trade to happen in this kind of north south corridor, right? So to speak, the U.S. led you know policy here which has not been able to happen in the past 20 years at all because it's just this bottleneck of Afghanistan was too huge. Um, but all of this has changed um, and it's just going to make this region more connected and you know, with that comes with terrorist issues but also a lot of positive opportunities when it comes to trade. Um, but I'll leave Nagis to, to explain more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, that's great. Uh, Nagis. Yes, uh, th thanks a lot. On the first one, or the first question, uh, intersection of human security, trade, uh, trade and economy. Well, uh, on human security, um, human rights discourse is not big in Central Asia, right? So we are not the, you know, the biggest promoters. Um, what worries people is the you know what's happening to their core ethnics we see it with the you know in the case of Xinjiang you know so so Kazakhs and Kyrgyz are worried about the, the their core ethnics in the region what's happening to them first and foremost uh we see it uh, now with the uh, you know Tajik uh, well Tajikistan and uh, and Afghanistan the Rahman Rahman talks about the, the Tajiks right he talks about the inclusive government but uh, first and foremost he's interested in uh, the uh, the Tajik minority being uh, uh, being represented and having kind of a piece uh, uh, a piece of a pie. So, um, so 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 there isn't that much concern uh, about what's happening uh, what's happening across uh, across the border. Otherwise, um, but there is concern about the kind of the the. Uh, the, the impact of the humanitarian crisis on uh, on the region, you know, and uh, uh, the waves of refugees, etc., cetera, uh, etc., cetera, etc. And there is also willingness to participate in the international efforts. We've seen that uh, we've seen that before, uh, kind of uh, play the role of the the responsible uh, responsible member of the international community, but also benefiting uh, uh, benefiting in the meantime because you know the the. Uh, well, we see Tajikistan saying, "Okay, we need assistance. If you want us to provide assistance to to uh, to Afghans, we need uh, we need you to finance uh, finance these operations." But um, but countries like Kazakhstan, they were ready to chip in. You know, uh, there were the scholarships for for Afghan students and, and and so on and so forth. But but that was done because you know Kazakhstan wants to play this role of a uh, regional leader and you know have a good standing uh, in the uh, in the international uh, international community. Uh, so trade, uh, trade connectivity. I absolutely agree with what uh, Niva said, and uh, there is this big interest. Particularly, Uzbekistan is uh, uh, enthusiastic about this opportunity uh, for, for transit uh, and access to markets uh, in, in in South Asia because Uzbekistan now you know is opening up. It wants to connect. It wants to trade. It wants to have investment. So uh, so for them. For them, that that's a good solution. Yeah, um, uh, but uh, I, I don't know what they think internally, what their calculations are. I, I think the, the rhetoric so far has been a bit too uh, too optimistic, excessively optimistic. Like you know, we just had the, this Tashkent uh, um, big Tashkent conference in summer, right? Um, discussing these great connectivity projects, uh, um, Central Asia, Afghanistan, South Asia, you know, when they, when things were already not good on the ground. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, so I don't, I don't know what the uh, Uzbek uh, policymakers uh, think for, for real uh, and how the, how they actually uh, see the situation and prospect. Uh, as somebody without access to, to this kind of information, I'm, I'm quite skeptical. Um, I'm skeptical the, the, about the kind of this 
great potential materializing soon because uh, because the, the you know it's a big question whether the Taliban can actually consolidate uh, uh, consolidate control over the country. You know what's gonna what, what's gonna happen in Afghanistan? Whether uh, the uh, uh, there will be more resistance to them and kind of this new kind of northern alliance in a new shape will uh, will emerge um, and uh, and and also whether they will be able to to attract investments in these projects uh, before you know actors like the world bank were supporting like casa 1000 and you know uh, like basically there was this support and push uh, to build these infrastructure projects and uh, and connectivity who is going to you know invest uh, who's going to invest now um i think there might be some symbolic uh, symbolic investments but personally i don't envision anything on a big scale uh, in the near future uh, but as for drug trafficking that's the only regional trade network that kind of flourished you know uh, over the years it's uh, it's sort of working impeccably uh, uh, under any regime um so except for when you know the Taliban were ruling for the first time and they 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 had this crackdown on uh, on uh, the on growing opium and that was you know fairly successful but uh, I think it's a big question whether they will introduce a similar policy again because uh, because that's such a huge source of income uh, and and they don't have many alternative sources of income. And if anything, the narco state flourished over the past, you know, uh, past decades. So, so, you know, so many people are involved and so many vested interests uh, and, and, and actually on both sides, right, um, of the border. So here, I think things will sort of continue. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Oh, that's great. And that, I think, you know, um, connects us to the question about Russia and the paradox of, you know, Moscow's concerned about the spillover effects of narco trade on the one hand, and yet those state and non-state actors who also have an interest in, in narco trade. So, um, Maxim, we'll turn it over to you sure. for, for the last question. Yeah, to, to, to your question, what happens if the Taliban fail to deliver upon the other three uh, commitments? Uh, so first of all, of course, it's a big if, right? It's, it's, it's not unlikely to happen or rather not, not happen tomorrow. Uh, some time has to pass. I'm pretty sure that uh, there is this, uh, uh, you know, idea that the, 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 everyone wants to see how well or how capable the Taliban are not just conquering territory, but how good they are at the governance and how different they are at governing Afghanistan from what they've been doing in the 1990s. Uh, that said, I think there's also a realistic assessment of that they may indeed not be able to deliver upon these commitments. Simple, uh, for, for different reasons, right? You're talking about the drug trade, you've mentioned already, and our, my colleague mentioned already different interests in uh, by the uh, state and non-state actors, and I would even exacerbate to say some some elites being involved in this on, on different in different countries. Uh, and obviously, I think there's also a reasonable expectation that the country will get pretty even even more poor, right, than 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 it is today. And then uh, growing opium may end up being the, if not the only, but one of the major uh, sources of income, and that that, that that's become an issue. Uh, the second thing on the uh, uh, spillover of instability, uh, I would perhaps my my colleague uh, Dr. Kasanova knows knows better. I would perhaps think that the real or a real rather threat to many uh, governments in Central Asia and Tajikistan in particular is not so much from the civil opposition groups, but maybe from different radical groups that, that may either infiltrate or end up as a sleeper cells uh, and then get, uh, you know, uh, activated at some point and they may present a threat to, to the government. Right now, I think uh, Moscow in assessing what happens if the Taliban fail to deliver upon their commitments, pursues this track where on the one hand, it uh, 
conducts military drills and is trying to activate ties within the uh, collective security treaty organization, CSTO, uh, especially with the member states of, of Central Asia there and trying to beef up them militarily and also in terms of, you know, military intelligence exchange and this stuff. But on the other hand, is trying to mount what I would call a massive containment infrastructure around Afghanistan as such, uh, getting involved with organizations such as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, but also and bilaterally with Pakistan, with India, uh, with China, uh, with, with uh, Iran, although to a lesser extent. Uh, and, you know, in all of the conversations that you see that Foreign Minister Lavrov now has, or President Putin, or the National Security Council Secretary Nikolai Patrushev, Afghanistan is big, which gives me uh, reason to think that, uh, like I said, there is this idea that the Af Afghanistan issue should be kind of surrounded by this diplomatic quasi-military containment that everyone in, who is involved or may potentially be concerned with this issue can have a share and can have a voice and, and be sure if it, if it grows into a bigger problem, it becomes a collective problem, not just Russia's responsibility, because Russia also has its own kind of quote-unquote Afghanistan syndrome. Uh, and I don't think that military involvement is in the cards, at least for now. But like I said, it's a big if, and perhaps it, it's it's not going to happen tomorrow. It will take some time, and uh, that may give us a whole bunch of options, given how uh, the situation evolves, who is in power uh, in, in Moscow, and, and, and things like this. All right, thank you. Three, three, three really um, just complex connected uh, answer. Um, um, we are uh, invited everyone to ask questions. I would just remind you that a question ends in a question mark. Um, so thank you for taking that into consideration. We'll try to read from the chat and then also I see one hand raised. So either you can either raise your hand or place into the chat. So let me begin and we'll try to get as many of these covered as possible, okay? Um, so the first question is from uh, Saurabh Shah, and he says, many voices caution the U.S. in any dealings with the Taliban to be careful that the Taliban do not cheat or renege on their agreements. Do Russia and China worry that the Taliban will renege or cheat? And I think we addressed some of that in the, the Russian case, but um, we can continue. Either Russia and or China. Uh, would any anyone like to go with that from our panelists? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go first if it's okay. Uh, I think uh, Russia obviously does not operate on the basis that you can trust what the Taliban say. It's perhaps it operates on the basis whether the Taliban uh, need Moscow to not be a spoiler to whatever they're going to be up to in Afghanistan. So that's why it operates on the premise that uh, they will uh, behave in a manner that at least will not irritate uh, Moscow. Uh, if only for their own interests, not because, you know, they're, they're such not nice guys that, that you can trust. But also the thing, I think, with this trust, it is not a mere antonym of, of trust, uh, but it also, when you distrust someone, you tend to prescribe some negative, uh, negative things to their behavior or expect something bad from them. So I think that's also kind of in, 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 in the calculus uh, but I think I've, I've addressed that by saying that Russia is uh, keeping its powder dry at the same time as it's trying to do all this diplomatic engagement. Nargis, uh, Neva, anything? Would you like to add or no? Yeah, if I just jump in on the China side. Um, so at the moment, I think with um, particularly new situations like these for the Chinese is difficult to gauge what really are the leaders in Beijing are thinking because the, the statements that they give, the official statements are really vague. So, but then there is a window to that policy world and that is um, with the op-eds and the commentary made by Chinese um, think tank people, Chinese scholars in China. So um, in my documentation, there's been about 12 op-eds since the August 15th, 
um, in China about the fall of Kabul and all the things that is to do with China and Afghanistan going forward. And um, I think the same as Russia, actually majority of these Chinese scholars are asking China to not be so naive and actually do not trust the Taliban. So these are Chinese scholars who have studied Afghanistan, has studied Central Asia um, for their careers. And they are all saying, they're all advising to not trust the Taliban. And the rationale behind it is that um, China's foreign policy with a lot of countries, first and foremost, focus on the economics. It focuses on helping that country build up you know, economic development and to use this leverage to then ask for other political favors. So that was, it's been so clear in Central Asia, this is a classic case. But then these Chinese scholars have said that economic development and improving livelihood is not Taliban's priority. Taliban's priority is whether or not they can build a government and build a regime that in their way of life that is Islamic. And this is not just the Taliban leaders, but also the, the people that support Taliban, they want this. And because of this, um, you know, there is really very little room for China. And then they also bring up the fact that, um, uh, uh, you know, it's, you know, one of the, the key things that China is asking, you know, like Max says, you know, the red line, you know, one of the biggest red line for China is that, you know, the Taliban needs to truly cut ties with the East Turkestan movement. And a lot of these Chinese scholars, you know, what they are saying is that it's impossible that the Taliban will really cut ties um, because of the how familiar um, are, are these two kind of ideology and, and, and the kind of you know, Islamic um, ideology behind it. And it's really interesting because actually on the 9th of September, so a couple of weeks ago, Taliban did an exclusive interview with the Global Times is one of China's like, you know, kind of more English facing, international facing um, state uh, and, uh, news outlet. Um, where the Taliban members are actually saying to the Chinese that um, they don't have East Turkestan movement members anymore in Afghanistan. They were, they were really stressing this in this interview. Um, but then a few days later, repeatedly um, coming from the Chinese MFA press conference and China in other settings, China is still saying that uh, 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 they recognize what Taliban said in this interview, but then they kept saying that, well, we need, you know, more evidence, we, we need Taliban to actually comply um, with uh, getting rid of international terrorist groups. So it's, it's obvious that China is not satisfied. And it is almost, there is nothing that the Taliban can actually do to make China kind of stop worrying about this. Um, unless, you know, the Taliban will really sign up for all of those um, uh, 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 economic regimes, uh, uh, political mm -hmm. regimes and economic kind of investments that, you know, can, can put China in a, in, in a place where it can, it can have more leverage on Afghanistan, on, on Taliban. Other than that, um, there is absolutely no trust um, as of now. And I think, um, you know, this is, this is going to be, you know, a, a very tricky situation because like Max says, you know, what, what, you know, not just Russia, but China right now is also just thinking of containment, you know, containing everything that Afghanistan, the, the, the effects that are coming out of Afghanistan. Um, and it is not ideal. Can I say? Oh, thank, you. thank you. Nargis, do you want to follow? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I fully agree with what Neva said. And uh, I think it's an important point that China does not have much room for maneuver and nobody else has much room for maneuver. Uh, so what are the kind of the options on the table? And it's not, you know, kind of it's really not the choice between trusting or not trusting. And not, nobody really fully trusts uh, tr trust Taliban, you know, including the, the Pakistanis, you know. So, uh, but I think it's more kind of what 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 quid pro quo you can do with Taliban and how sustainable this uh, this uh, quid pro quo would be. Um, so that, that everybody's kind of trying to calculate <laughs> calculate uh, the, the, these options and uh, uh, and kind of trade offs. Uh, I think at the um, at the moment. So because one thing is clear that Taliban are you know are in. Right, and they are a formidable force to 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 reckon with. Uh, and I, I have a sort of disturbing sense that, in a way, you know, this kind of desire to have them actually consolidate consolidate control and you know, kind of have some some order and stability uh, in Afghanistan. You know, despite all the the kind of uh, the horrors uh, that would. Uh, um, 
will come with this uh, with this arrangement. Yeah, you you're all sort of highlighting this issue of stateness and also regime type. Um, what are the Im implications of Afghanistan for stateness in the region, but also of the type of regime? But I don't want to um, go down the political science rabbit hole. I'm sorry I went that way for a moment, but here's a second question, and I think. Maybe starting with Nargis, it, I, I think it makes sense. Vasily Petropoulos says, what does the Taliban takeover mean for India? And in particular, for India's big investment in um, the southeastern port in Iran of Chabahar that would connect Delhi to the four key cities of Afghanistan, Kabul, Mazar sharif Herat, and Kandahar, and would bypass Pakistan. He mm -hmm. asked, could the project materializing serve as an Indian response to China's Gwadar port? in Pakistan? Yeah, um, okay, so uh, for India, it's the, the, the new arrangement is not good, that, that's for sure. I think what, what kind of the, I, I didn't mention it, but that's a new situation, yeah, that uh, Pakistan now is sort of is closer to the region politically than it used to be. Uh, uh, so, so it's now we are talking to 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 Pakistan, right? That that that's uh, that's what uh, uh, Rahman is doing, and he is asking Imran Khan to you know to help organize uh, organize these talks between the, the Taliban and the opposition in in Dushanbe. So Pakistan is definitely a more important uh, uh, player now, um, more than ever, um, which is not good for for India, obviously. Um, as for the Chabahar uh, port, uh, well, the you can get to Chabahar port. Uh, you know, Afghanistan is not the only way you can get to to Chabahar from uh, from Central Asia. We do have uh, um, uh, we do have these links and corridors uh, to, to Iran. So, so it's kind of if there is this loss of the Afghanistan corridor, then there are other corridors. Uh, and if anything, I think uh, Iran, the role of Iran will be growing uh, and uh, uh, and we see the, the kind of the improvement of Iran Tajikistan relations with the, and the, you know the, with the new president uh, Raisi. Uh, and if you know the, these negotiations between the international community and Iran on the nuclear issue go well, then again, you know, kind of that will uh, that will make Iran kind, kind of that will allow Iran to play a bigger role in all these connectivity uh, connectivity projects. But uh, China and Iran, we know that the, the partnership is is quite uh, is quite good now, and uh, it's pretty solid, I would say, and promising. Max, Max, or uh, Max, do you want to add anything on Niva? No. 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 All right, I'm going to read one more question from the chat line and then I'll go to the hands raised. Andrew Thornbrook asks, he says, Beijing and Moscow appear united or appear united in efforts to undermine U.S. influence across the world in the wake of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. But surely there must be fault lines between Beijing and Moscow. So could a Taliban controlled Afghanistan bring to the fore uh, longstanding uh, differences between Russia and China in terms of their long-term strategic goals? And how might the Sino-Russian relationship then be potentially negatively affected by a Taliban-controlled Afghanistan? Uh, I, can, I can go first if, if, if that's okay, unless, okay. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, just, just to, just to uh, perhaps for starters, I'd say that in, as far as Afghanistan is concerned, the U.S. Is, has done a lot more than Russia and China together in terms of undermining its position. So Ru Russia and, and, and China here are, in a way, picking up low-hanging fruits of, of, of gloating and, and bashing and, and, and making the most of the U.S. Uh, actions in, in Afghanistan. But it is, it is indeed true that now that Russia and China appear on different venues together, uh, on the situation in Afghanistan, uh, it may create the sense that they're trying to do something together uh, on Afghanistan, which I, well, it, perhaps the, the only factor that unites Moscow and Beijing right now is uh, grave concern over what may come next. 
but the interests uh, that the two countries pursue uh, in uh, uh, as far as in, 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 in towards Afghanistan are, in my view, different. Uh, there is this debate within Russian policymaking community right now on the scale of ambition that Russia should uh, seek in Afghanistan, with one uh, group suggesting that uh, Russia should, uh, you know, seek quote unquote full deal, not only security, but also trying to, you know, exploit some opportunities on the exploration of rare earth metals other economic uh, development projects, roads and, and stuff. And uh, uh, the other group is cautioning uh, against this deeper involvement uh, and says that uh, our strategy should be security oriented only. So Russia should not care about the, the state building or the development or infrastructure because the Afghanistan is, uh, is, 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 is a black hole that will suck all the resources and, and drain all the resources and stuff. So Russia should not be uh, following that track. Whereas, uh, and you know, some even speaking of India, some point to India say that, that invested so much in Afghanistan under the, uh, you know, this is civilian government and now uh, it finds itself in trouble for, for you know, for not having a decent return on its investments. Uh, the Chinese, uh, in my view, uh, have, have been investing a lot more and are interested, uh, have, a, have a much more ambitious interest towards Afghanistan. Uh, from here, it appears that Afghanistan is important to the uh, ultimate uh, success of their uh, One Belt, One Road initiative, right? So, it's not just, you know, it's kind of security that is closely linked to their economic projects and investments. So in that sense, uh, Russia stakes all over, but uh, serious uh, because the, the scale of this radicalization uh, perhaps may be, uh, I don't want to say it's more important than that for China. It is important for China as well, but it's just uh, geographically more dispersed. Uh, across the Russian territory, like I said, it just does not boil down to Central Asia. It also has to do with Russia's own uh, Muslim populated uh, areas. Uh, I guess, or Niva, do you want to follow up? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think largely this question, you know, on the one hand, like it first needs to, we need to see how Taliban turns out. So I think that will dictate a lot of what China can do or is willing to do. Um, so obviously if Taliban turns out to what well, at the moment it is, it is not looking to, but if, um, if, if it makes a very drastic turn of having a more inclusive government, something like this, then, you know, China is also willing to reciprocate and, you know, go in and build some roles that it does, that the Taliban would ask something like this. Um, but then I think when it comes to the whole debate, the whole kind of dynamic with Russia, and this has been you know, pointed out repeatedly by a lot of Chinese scholars in China, is the fact that when it comes to the Afghanistan situation, and that was even before the fall of Kabul, um, Chinese scholars have said that you know, if China doesn't engage militarily, or if China doesn't do more in the security front, then eventually Central Asian states are going to realize that you know, Russia, after all, is the only security provider that can concretely do um, you know, things that provide actual reassurance that things are going to be okay. So, and, and these Central Asian insecurities will feel more reliance um, kind of on, on Russia and, you know, China would be in the back room. And already in this kind of military front, like China is extremely insecure about this because all of these kind of Shanghai Cooperation Organization military exercises that we have seen and all of these kind of regional military engagement that involves China, China is always at the back of the room because of the language problem. You know, all of these Central Asian countries, armies, personnel, you know, from decision makers, commanders to, you know, a soldier level all speak Russian. And when you have a Chinese commander that always have to be accompanied by a translator, which cannot translate everything, it's, there's always a barrier. And, that, and this is always the Chinese insecurity. And this is also one of the biggest kind of hesitancy on the Chinese front to actually engage 
in the security front because it, it knows that it has to do something so drastic. Um, and this is something that China is not ready to do. So I think going forward, it's still always going to be like this. Russia will always have this kind of upper hand in, in terms of security. And which is why China for a very long time actually didn't mind um, Afghanistan to have this Afghan government, even though it's backed by the West because it was stable. It was pursuing uh, an Islamic uh, policy that was more moderate, it is more predictable. But Afghanistan, um, Taliban right now, of course, like this is not the case. Um, and then I also want to just like, I'm not sure if Max agrees with this, but Russia and China has a very good consensus about each other's interests. Um, and in a global in a global sense, both China and Russia understands what needs to be done. But then of course, on smaller issues, um, for example, in this region, when it comes to, um, um, you know, uh, tariffs of um, energy uh, transport, for example, you know, Russia will do anything to compete with China in terms of drawing the rules of the game um, in, in, in economics. So these are, these are smaller things that it, it wouldn't even constitute uh, uh, as a conflict because these are just China and Russia pursuing its own interests with whatever means regionally speaking. And these, these are not conflicts. These are, these are really just working, working things out, right? I think um, we can call it that. And then, you know, I, I think I, I had just one small comment on the previous question. Actually, I was, I was still thinking a little bit more about it, but I think, you know, this, comp this discussion of, you know, these ports being in competition with each other doesn't really quite make sense because, you know, at the end of the day, these are business decisions, right? if these ports coexist with each other, they compete and whoever that is the lowest price, companies will go for that. Companies that offer the best kind of, you know, feasible logistics plan uh, and security for cargoes will be the choice of the companies. So I think it is, it is not so much of a, of, a, of, a, of a political matter, but then if we do want to talk about, you know, the security problems of the ports, going through Afghanistan, um, especially the, 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 the places that, you know, the question mentioned are very ethnically diverse places. And at the moment, and this is part of why the, the idea of connectivity and this new light and new hope for connectivity is so still in the long term, is because the government that Taliban puts forward right now is not inclusive. So this has a, a long term implication in all these like smaller ethnic conflicts in these places that you mentioned, like Herat, Kandahar, all these places are going to have issues with uh, smaller in scale ethnic conflicts. So when that is the case, then compared to Iran, of mm -hmm. course, where would businesses go, right? Um, and then when it comes to BRI, yes, the Ben Road Initiative can benefit a lot from Afghanistan because at the end of the day, the point is China wants to diversify trade routes. So having Afghanistan open is, is great, but then having Afghanistan you know, not part of the BI is also okay because like Nagi said, you know, Central Asia already has a lot of corridor getting into Iran and going through the Caspian Sea, this middle corridor to Turkey, it already exists. So it's not a life or death, you know, situation for China to not have Afghanistan in the bed and road uh, uh, chess game. Okay, that leads, I think, to Nagis uh, naturally, and you had, you, you were gonna speak before too, so on this same question, then we'll go to the hands up. Yeah, actually, well, I I, I agree with that again. Uh, the, I don't see differences between Russia and China in Afghanistan, but but in Central Asia, there is some there is some competition uh, in the security in the security sphere, and uh, it's changing. The situation is changing. If the the if before Russia had this sort of monopoly, um, it's getting diluted, uh, and you know. Now there is this uh, outpost, uh, Chinese outpost on the Tajik Afghan border. Something you know we couldn't imagine, we couldn't imagine before. There is a lot of cooperation. There are trainings and so on and so forth. And uh, and I wanted to would how you know unsurmountable this uh, language barrier uh, will be over time. I was you know surprised to find out recently that. Uh, uh, military academies in a couple of uh, African countries, they they, uh, they have Chinese language as a compulsory, you know, compulsory language part of the part of the curriculum. So, uh, so of course not tomorrow, but uh, uh, but I think we 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 can expect more uh, more security uh, security cooperation. 
Okay, all right. Um, I'm going to go to the hands up, and we're, you know, now beginning to sort of press up against time. We have about 20 minutes left and a lot of questions. So uh, ask, ask your question, and then also for the panelists, um, if we can have kind of more abbreviated responses, then we get more questions. Um, you know, sorry to even put it in that zero some way. Um, okay, Stan, you've had your question, your hand up. For yeah, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Sanik Lai. I'm from Afghanistan and I'm a Fletcher alumni. Uh, I have a question and then my friend who is sitting next to me will be also having a comment on your discussion. Uh, just, my question just, is... Just, just questions, just questions. Okay, sure, sure. Uh, my question is that we know even from your discussions in generally that Pakistan has a huge influence on Taliban. Uh, first of all, providing the safe havens now internationally lobbying for them. So they definitely have a, um, a upper hand on Taliban comparing to other countries. But at the meantime, uh, China and US have their own interests in Afghanistan. And Pakistan is having relation, uh, we can say a good relation to both of them. How Pakistan will keep balance between both countries who have almost conflict of interest and against each other. As Navy said, China definitely wanted US to be out of Afghanistan. So how Pakistan will play and keep balance between China and uh, uh, US? So my question is to Navy. I'm just uh, uh, giving the, uh, the floor to my friend who is also having a question. Thank you to the panelists for uh, their presentations. Uh, so these days, uh, after the fall of Kabul, we see Afghanistan at the center of uh, the scholarly community, at the center of analysis. And we see you know, daily analysis about what's happening there. Uh, what's missing in our analysis is, uh, is morality. It's a fundamental lack of humanity in, in our analysis. We keep talking about regional approaches, but there is no such thing as a regional approach. These are individual country specific approaches uh, that are only focusing on what matters to, to a single country. So the change in authorities in, in Afghanistan we heard today what it means for China, what it means for Russia, what it means for other Central Asian countries, but what does it mean for Afghans? And the fundamental question that Afghans are asking these days is, is there a single positive player in Afghanistan? And, and whether Afghans have any friends. So our request, our recommendation to the scholarly community uh, people who are watching Afghanistan, commenting on Afghanistan, observing Afghanistan, is that they need to, uh, you know, it's important that we keep in sight the humanity, the morality and ethical aspect of, of our analysis. You know, well, transformation, massive transformation has happened in Afghanistan. 20 years of hard work, millions of dreams and aspirations important human capacity that has been created there. Fundamentally, we, are, we were a decent uh, you know, member of international community committed to all fundamental human, uh, human rights. We're on a path towards uh, prosperity and greater stability, but all of a sudden everything collapses. And we see, you know, so what, what is important important here so, so is, i'm going to uh, interrupt i'm just going to i'm sorry to have to interrupt because we we want to get as many questions as possible so your question then is about the ethics the or the afghan ethical people. framework where is there an yes. ethical framework that can support yeah. the afghan people from where we where can... yes where are the afghan people in our analysis okay thank you thank you all right so those two questions taken together Nargis, do you want to start? Uh, so the first question was on, sorry, on Pakistan? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm not an expert on Pakistan, so 
I'll be afraid to, to, to tackle that. On the humanitarian crisis, uh, on the, sorry, on the, uh, the kind of fate of the Afghan people, uh, it's, it's so difficult, really. It's so painful to, um, to, follow, to follow the developments, uh, developments in the country. Uh, and, uh, well, I, I mentioned the humanitarian crisis and that, that there is, you know, what's, what's, what's happening. I, in you know in the country and I, I do hope that uh, uh, that the international community will will be able to uh, to to do you know to to to, to play 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 its role uh, and you know kind of I I think we're all dreading the winter right I mean it's sort of this perfect storm situation you know it's uh, it's very bad now but it might get even worse so. Um, I don't know what to say. It's really, it's really, really horrible. Max, Niva? Uh, very briefly, I mean, look, I, I totally echo the sentiment of, of, of the, uh, the person who made comment. Uh, definitely at the core of this issue, there's got to be this uh, moral and humanitarian aspect. Uh, just speaking on the Russian side, uh, that there are many experts on Afghanistan uh, in in our country who do talk about these issues and 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 actually are critical of of of, of uh, many actions and saying you know Russia shouldn't be cooperating with the Taliban because they're bringing some brutal practices and uh, enforced rad radical Islamization and things like this. So they're so they're not uh, kind of reverting to geopolitics only. On the Pakistan issue, I think it's pretty in a pretty uh, rather good state for now, precisely uh, because of the things you've mentioned. It has pretty good relations with the U.S. and China, uh, and ultimately, both the United States and China want to make sure that Afghanistan is not uh, a safe haven for terrorists or other destructive forces that that can uh, endanger uh, the United States or China. And both see Pakistan because of its influence on the Taliban, and even though it's not 100% influence, and they have their own issues with the Taliban, they perceive Pakistan as a key to uh, ensuring that Afghanistan is the place that they they want to seek. It is not in danger of both both uh, U.S. and China. So in theory, uh, the the you know the the the, the, the it looks pretty good for, for the Pakistan. We'll need to see how masterful they can play uh, their, their status and their resources right now. Okay, Neva, do you want to, to add yeah. to this? Yeah, um, just very quickly, I think Max already turned out, um, already um, put the very kind of key points there, but then I think when it comes to the relations between China and Pakistan, um, there's just one, key point I want to put forward is the fact that since the Belt and Road Initiative, um, China has gone into Pakistan, mainly working with the Pakistani military, and it has empowered the role of the Pakistani military. And this has, you know, like other countries like Central Asia as well, kind of created this um, polarization between elite and the local community. And this is, you know, a price that, you know, Chinese companies and Chinese personnel are paying every single day working in Pakistan. And then it comes to the ethical question. Um, when it comes to China, I think we all know that, you know, through international organizations like the United Nations, China has actually been one of the, you know, very proactive actor in Afghanistan prior to the, to the fall of Kabul, you know, in supporting women's work and funding Kind of women's education and, and all of these humanitarian aid projects you know of course us has done billions and billions every year but china also does its share you know through international organizations it doesn't do it directly but you know china has been there and there's you know a growing population in afghanistan and 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 i'm sure you know this uh, uh you know being from afghanistan is that you know china is you know opening up to be a very promising option because china doesn't ask too many questions and precisely because china's strategy abroad is always a geo-economical one you know there are you know uh, creating jobs uh, uh, uh creating these like technical transfers you know um 
you know, improving food security and, and all of these things at the same time, there is, you know, China doesn't ask too many questions. It, it is not, you know, uh, there to intervene local politics, except it will want to capture the local elites and making sure that the local elites will uh, uh, continue to, you know, support China's, you know, kind of political goals in, in, in the global world. Um, so, you know, this is a choice that ultimately, you know, Taliban will have to decide which, which way is it, because China is also very clear, if you don't follow China's political goals and you do not agree, then you get, then you get nothing as well. This is very clear with these um, kind of economic uh, games that, you know, China has, you know, done towards most recently Australia and, and, and then, you know, a couple of years ago, Philippines. So it's, it's very um, it, it is a choice that, you know, countries like Afghanistan now has to make. Oops. Okay, great. Uh, we have, Slavar, a question from you, your hand has been raised, and then I'm going to read, uh, combine uh, two questions on the chat, so we can have both questions uh, asked together. So, Slavar, your, your turn. Thank you very much. Uh, I have two questions. One is, uh, based on what uh, uh, all of the presenters mentioned, uh, there is a gap between nations and states. So most of the nations don't like Taliban and states are becoming a bit you know, cautiously towards uh, Taliban to see what, what is the behavior. So maybe they come uh, with, with different uh, you know, deals. Uh, but on the other hand, in the... Um, international community or, or the commentators. Uh, I haven't seen much of strong position or analysis about uh, Taliban because no one knows them. They are a new government. Uh, it's gonna take time to, to have their behavior uh, realized and their, their position realized. Uh, the first question is when or under what conditions the states are going to go back to their uh, nations and tell them that our decision, our approach was the correct one regarding to, to the Taliban. And the second question, in contrast to the first one, if uh, the Taliban uh, wants to integrate with the international community in any way and becomes a good boy, what would be the policy recommendations to them so that they uh, better or successfully go through this integrate, integrity? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sabra, for both questions. And I'll add the final one on, which is a combination um, from Alex Thomas and uh, I'll find the other one, Tatiana Androsov. Um, the first is, they both ask about religion. What does the message, what message does the Taliban's reclaiming of Afghanistan send to Central Asian countries about the role of Islam in government? And Islam, uh, it says as Islamic countries, or I guess that means Muslim majority countries that are constitutionally secular, Will this affect the desire for deeper integration into Uzbek, Kyrgyz, and Kazakh societies? And the second um, related question by Tatiana says, um, this raises the issue of the interpretation of religion, culturally specific interpretations of religion. And what does that mean in terms of Taliban interpretation versus other national or local cultural interpretations of Islam? So we have about six minutes left, five minutes left, that's a lot, but we hope you can cover some or all three of those questions. I can start. Yeah. Uh, well, on the the, the, the first question, um, states are, are hesitant at the moment. There is no recognition of the, the Taliban government, right? Uh, the, well, so far they were not allowed to uh, to give a speech at the UN uh, UN General Assembly, the you know N Nepal refused to to host them uh, in the SARC meeting. Now, so uh, so it's still you know kind of it's still wait and see uh, uh, wait and see period. It will be really interesting to see how that will kind of play out and unfold uh, the, the the recognition bit. Um, and the Taliban seem to be uh, quite uh, uh, heady with their success, you know? So we see it in the, uh, you know, the, 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 in this new government, uh, they, they, they are, you know, they really 
didn't do it to please the, the international community and to all these uh, um, outside players with the you know partial exception of Pakistan. Um, so so into like being a good boy, we don't see that you know uh, don't see that at the moment. As for the religious question, um, I don't see I, I don't envision you know the the Taliban run uh, Afghanistan kind of be in any way a role model for, for, for Central Asians, you know, having any uh, any attraction. Uh, and uh, Central Asian uh, nation states, they're not on the verge of, you know, an Islamic revolution. Um, so uh, so I I think I, I, I already mentioned that the, the, the Taliban are just, you know, too archaic for, uh, for Central Asians. They're not fully in modernity. They're sort of, you know, with one foot in modernity, one foot in some, uh, previous <laughs> previous ages uh so and, and central asia is in modernity you know so uh yeah i don't think that that that's a yeah there is a possibility of that. okay um should we go max and then um eva to close out sure 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 thank you three three points real quick uh, one, I don't know on what uh, conditions uh, the governments go back to their people and say we're, we're accurate in our approach to the Taliban, but I can imagine a scenario uh, when the government may go back to the people and say we were wrong about the Taliban. It is when uh, the Taliban uh, either fosters relations with them, some uh, other extremist organizations, uh, either ISIS or Al-Qaeda, or there might be uh, terrorist attacks coming from Afghanistan to uh, the territories of, of, of these governments. So that will definitely be the point where uh, the governments will go back to the people and say, look, we were wrong expecting the Taliban to be any different from what they were back in 1990s. Uh, I can actually imagine a scenario, which I think we have not discussed, but perhaps should be thinking about it, when the Taliban act does not grip uh, hold to power. Right, they, they, they are composed of uh, warring factions. Uh, the ambitions of their different leaders uh, are in, in conflict uh, very often. So, and they may be engulfed in a typical situation for revolutionary movements when they start fighting for uh, power and resources and positions and end up uh, being, you know, either uh, challenged by some outside force such as maybe ISIS-K, uh, or, you know, something something may happen to them. So I would still have to wait and see whether the Taliban can consolidate power as a united group now that they have to govern, actually, and not be challenged or, you know, lose sight of control of the territory. And on the religious aspect, uh, I'll just perhaps uh, say something that I've already mentioned. I think what happened is 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 bad in in the sense that while uh, of course there this you know the Taliban are different from other religious groups, including in the scope of uh, their ambition of what exactly they want to control and what type of Islamic hammer they want to build on the Afghan territory only, as they say, and it's it's not like a global jihadist movement as, such as ISIS or Al Qaeda. Uh, but for people who do not uh, necessarily get these nuances but are indoctrinated by some uh, radicalization ideas, this may serve as a, as a bad uh, precedent. So I, my personal fear is that their success in Afghanistan uh, may be giving additional boost for different Islamist movements across the globe, uh, but I, I hope I'm, I'm wrong in, in this assessment. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And Neva, we have just a little bit of time left, but it would be great to hear from you as well. Okay, I'll be really quick as well. Um, I think when it comes to states doing the right thing, I think China definitely already sees itself as having done the right thing in Afghanistan, which has been pretty hands off. There has been effort where China tried to go in with some investment proposals with the Taliban actually, but China failed to gain any, you know, accurate, uh, any substantial security guarantee from the Taliban. So this never really actually happened, you know, all these investments. Um, and, you know, China has followed this like respecting, you know, an Afghan-led Afghanistan kind of principle. So in a way, China definitely sees, sees itself as the most righteous 
uh, 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 you know, major power um, when it comes to the Afghanistan situation. And I just want to follow, you know, Max's point on, you know, we haven't discussed on a civil war situation in Afghanistan. And I think, you know, even if it doesn't happen now, even if, you know, Taliban can actually consolidate power, you know, this, um, Eventually, when international businesses go into Afghanistan, particularly when China uh, uh, takes its wallet into Afghanistan, you know, all of the the money actually will create new conflicts in Afghanistan because all of these different areas have different level of resources and they all worth different things. And you know, it, it will be extremely difficult for a country like China to actually navigate, you know, where to go first, um, and and things like that are going to fuel uh, future conflicts. And then on, on Nagis, you know, this point on modernization is, is extremely important. And this is exactly the reason why China has been asking for a regional effort, um, you know, from countries like Iran, from countries like Central Asia to actually um, guide the Taliban in forming uh, 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 this uh, inclusive uh, government and to craft a political regime. So. China is definitely way more de demanding uh, than, than Russia um, at the moment. And um, we will see, you know, how the Chinese model works. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all of our speakers, uh, Dr. Nargis Kasanova, Dr. Maxim Suchkov, Ms. Neva uh, Yan. And I want to thank also the um, two programs, the Russia and Eurasia program, Ed Fletcher and the Initiative on Religion, Law and Diplomacy. And I turn it over to um, our intrepid host, Arif Barakovsky. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I would like to uh, echo uh, your uh, deep appreciation to the distinguished panelists. Uh, I thought it was uh, an interesting uh, and thoughtful conversation. So thank you so much for your insightful remarks. Uh, this is very much the beginning of a year long conversation that we will have uh, at the Fletcher School. And uh, I really want to um, express uh, our appreciation to the audience for your uh, thoughtful questions. Uh, and uh, thanks again to everyone who participated in organizing this event. Um, so good afternoon, good evening, or good night, depending on where you are in the world. And uh, please join me in a round of applause for our speakers. <laughs>